Hello everyone. My name is Carrie Hunter and I'm the Senior Director of the Center for Spiritual Living Victoria. And it's wonderful to have you here with me right here right now on this recording. And today is the first day of spring as I'm recording this. So it's, it's absolutely wonderful to, to just feel that invigorating sense of springtime even though it's a pretty chilly day here in Victoria. It's wonderful to have you here online. If ever you'd like to join us in person, we would certainly love to welcome you there. And I've often um, said to you that our address is 380 Cook Street. So we're in the Cook Street Village Activity Center, 1030 for meditation on Sunday morning and 11 o'clock for our celebra celebration service. It would be lovely to meet you in person. Some of you are starting to do that and it's really um, a great pleasure to welcome you there. So here as I'm recording this, it is late Sunday and uh, our service is now, is now finished for the day and I get to just relax and chat online for a few minutes and it's, it's really a pleasure to have you here with me. Uh, my topic for today is A Larger Life and I'm continuing with the series that I've been doing on Ernest Holmes' book A New Design for Living which I've said before is rapidly becoming one of my favorite books. It's just filled with so much wisdom. And I want to read, read to you a quote of Ernest Holmes um, about, this, about a larger life, about living a bigger life. He, he says, The biggest life is the one that gives the most, that loves the most, that includes the most, that has the greatest understanding and the greatest consciousness of eternal good and redistributes this good to the largest number of people. In other words, it's, it's sending out all of that goodness that is within us, all of that love, um, all of all of the um, the spiritual sense that we have of of everything in the world that can be better, and sending that out to the world. You know, love, joy, peace, grace, living in a in a different state of mind than perhaps we have lived in for a long, long time. It's about sharing it with others, sharing ourselves in a spiritual way with other people. And Ernest Holmes talks about the larger life and, and, and of course when he's talking about a larger life he's talking about a spiritual life which is larger than anything that we can imagine in terms of, of anything else that we're doing on this planet. Because when we're connected with spirit, when we are absolutely feeling that presence within and when we're living that kind of life then it's a larger life because we're able to live in a different way and we're able to accomplish things in a different way. And so so whatever it is that our desires might be, things that we have always wanted to do, are, are possible. We're, we, we understand that we are unlimited beings and as such with this power and presence that is flowing through us we can accomplish so much more. Now Ernest Holmes says that that one of the things that we do have to remember is that we are all spirit. We're spirit having a human experience. Our bodies are containers of God stuff. And as I was saying to our people this morning, the best metaphor I think that I can use is that of the ocean and a wave on the ocean. You know, we look at the ocean and we look at a wave and we, we don't think the wave is separate from the ocean. It's part of the ocean, but it individualizes itself as a wave. It still is the ocean. And in that same way, if we look at everything as a vast sea of God, then we are individualized expressions of God. We're like the wave on the ocean. And we have all of the properties of God within us. You know, we're made out of God stuff. And this is possibly one of the most challenging things for people to remember and for them to get their heads around. But it is so important that we do. Important that we always remember this. Dr. Holmes says, you know, there are people, if, you, if you're saying this kind of thing, there are people who are just going to think that it's absolutely blasphemous. And I thought about that and I was remembering way back, probably, I don't know, 30, maybe 40 years ago even, um, I was running a big international event and it was just a few weeks before we opened and, and there were 2,000 people who were attending. And the staff were pretty getting pretty burned out already because it was, it was a really big job. 
And some of us had been working quite late into the evening. There were about a dozen of us who had. And I decided to take everybody out for a bite to eat and, and a drink if they wanted one. You know, we just needed to just unwind a little bit. And as happens when you have a, a table of 12 people, there are often two or three conversations going on at once, and everybody isn't fully engaged in what's happening. And all of a sudden, I heard this deep voice, woman's voice, say, I am God. Well, all of the conversation at the table stopped. People just sat there in silence. And this woman then began to explain herself, but I was offended by that. And, and I wasn't really listening to her explanation. I just thought, how could anybody say something like that? Well, that was long before I discovered this teaching and before I certainly before I ever understood it. It was about 10 years after that that I went to my first um, Center for Spiritual Living. It was then called Center for Positive Living. And there was something that happened to me as I walked through the door. I just was transfixed by this overwhelming feeling of love. And I started to cry. And what happened was I had the feeling that I had come home. I had the feeling that I had come to the place where I was going to learn the truth about God, a God that I could understand. Now, that didn't happen immediately. I had no idea what the minister was talking about when she, she was talking about God within us that day. And she was also talking about um she was actually talking about prosperity that day and she said that all of our prosperity is is inside us and you know I was kind of thinking you know what does that mean are we like ATM machines where you push a certain number of buttons and the money pops out and of course that's not what it was but I really did not understand the thing is I wanted to understand I was being called to understand and so I en en enrolled in a class right away because she was beginning a class the following week. And that began my taking several classes at a time. And I loved every second of it. And I had this kind of high-flying career. I was, you know, flying around the world all the time and, uh, and, and was doing that for 17 years. But at the same time, there was something in me that was wanting to know more. And I was finding this to be something really beautiful in my life. And it didn't happen immediately. It took some, some studying, but I became a practitioner, um, a, a science of mind practitioner. And what that means is that I was licensed to pray. And I always thought that was kind of funny. You know, I'm going to get a t-shirt with licensed to pray written across it. And the thing is that it it's something that is a very, um, since it's a serious thing. And I don't mean serious in a way that, it, that it's not in, entertaining or interesting. Um, it's, it's something where we actually see our prayers demonstrated. First of all, uh, one has to demonstrate three, um, three, I'll call them miracles, uh, before we get, before we get licensed. You know, we write an exam. It, it's, it's serious stuff. It's not just something to be taken lightly. And the extraordinary thing is that, uh, that we do have these demonstrations, no matter what it is that we're praying for, we we spend a lot of time in prayer, and uh, and and it's a, it's a very satisfying thing. So we had the good fortune as practitioners to be able to pray with people whenever they needed prayer, whenever they needed comfort in some area of their lives. And Ernest Holmes' great gift to us was science of mind treatment or affirmative prayer as we also call it and it can be five steps or seven steps it can even be three steps when something's happening really quickly and you just you need a quick prayer to get out right away to face the drama and eliminate the drama that's right in front of you and so that was an important step in my life and then I was at this Silimar by the sea just outside of um, Monterey, California, for a church conference, and I, I went to that every year for a few years, and while it was while it was still in operation, and one day I wandered down to the beach. Uh, it was afternoon, and I'd been in sessions all morning, and I'd had my lunch, and it the beach in July in in Monterey or near Monterey is very cold, because there's all this heavy fog that rolls in in the summertime. And it isn't until really October that it starts to get really hot. 
so I what I did was I found a couple of big rocks and kind of wedged my body in between to keep warm and I just was sitting there looking at the Pacific Ocean in front of me and emptying my mind and I was in that space already um, in that God space of just feeling connected and then my mind was emptied of any trivial stuff at all and as I sat there I heard a voice inside me say and you're going to be a minister and I said who is saying that and I heard it again you're going to be a minister and I thought you know are you crazy I mean at my age starting all over again becoming a minister giving up my job giving up everything even moving away most likely and the feeling wouldn't go away and I finally had to acknowledge it and accept it except that there was this calling within me that was was inviting me into ministry it was more than an invitation it was it was um, it was a major push I have to say and so when I got back home I I told my friends and colleagues that I was going to go into ministry and friends who were already ministers said to me you know do you have any idea what's demanded and I said probably not but the thing is that this voice told me that that's what I'm going to do and each one of them said the same thing they said if you can do anything else do it don't do ministry you have no idea how difficult it is and I said I have to do it and I remember still one minister saying to me in other words you can't not do it and I said no I can't not do it it's something I have to do and she said okay then you have been called um, I, I, I did go through my ministerial training and when it was time to write my exams and to do my oral paneling in uh, Monterey I didn't think that I was good enough I didn't think that I was qualified enough to do something like that and I spoke with my teacher who said you're writing this exam and you're going on and you're going to be paneled and you are going to be a minister and I said I said I'm really really struggling with this and my my colleagues who were also in ministerial training with me you know were also supportive and, and saying to me you know you you know you have to do this and one of my colleagues who was also a dear friend said something to me that I'll never forget and that is really important it's important for each one of us to remember and she said God does not choose the qualified God qualifies the chosen and I started to cry and she was crying and at that moment I knew that I didn't have anything to worry about and I went on and did my exams and so on and I was licensed and the thing is that you know one tends to think of having a call as being a call to ministry or to doing this spiritual work but the thing is having a calling can be anything and when we accept that calling what we're doing is we are accepting a message from God this divinity that lives within us we're accepting we're accepting the fact that there is something there that we are to do and maybe only one of us is to do it or maybe many of us are to do it but it is a calling and if you feel qualified or you don't the thing is that God does qualify the chosen if you have a longing within you to do something you know it is never too late I know I was saying to, I was asking myself at my age why would I want to start something brand new at my age at any age starting something brand new is answering a call and it's an important thing to do because when we do we are engaging in a larger life and people said to me oh you've already got a life that is so grand you know it's it it's so interesting you're traveling all over um, you know you're meeting all kinds of interesting people there is no life larger than God's life and I have to say that when I became a minister and and I've been a minister now for 18 years when I became a minister and felt that presence within me I felt this expansiveness I understood what it meant to be a limitless being I understood what it meant to be able to 
manifest my life and to help others manifest theirs through the power of prayer. And I loved to pray. You know, and, and as I as I look back on that moment that I felt that calling when I was at a Selimar, um, I think of of Genesis when when God said said to Abraham, Depart from your country to a new land, and I will show you the way. You know, that's it's a metaphor. Depart from your country to another land. That's taking a complete about face in life and going going on a different path and and really understanding that God is showing us the way all the time. It was a moment of rare conviction and clarity and you know I got the opportunity to taste the nectar of of perfect love and peace and grace and joy. A taste of of the divinity within. It was the most humbling and beautiful experience. And I'm so grateful that for these past 18 years, I've been able to share these things, to share what I call the truth, the truth about God. And I was smiling as I thought about this the other day because when my little grandson, Jake, was two years old, he, he used to phone me quite regularly he'd always have something to chat about and he had six conversations at once going on in his head and he could speak very very clearly and it was anyway it was a Sunday morning and we were chatting and I said you know I have to get ready to go to church Jake and he said you go to church and I said yes and he said churches are bad and I said you know what do you mean churches are bad and he said churches don't tell the truth about God this is a two-year-old and I said, well, Jake, I'm going to be a minister. I'm going to have a church one day. And he said, oh, well, I would come to your church because I know you'd never lie about God. It was so sweet, but it also really touched me in a very deep place, too, where when I was first licensed, I said, I told that story about Jake, and I said, I promise to always tell the truth about God as much as I know it to be. And it has been an absolutely satisfying and wonderful journey. I'm so grateful for that. And so, you know, what we have to understand, whatever our calling might be, whatever that inner prompting is, that when we're, when we're in alignment with God, when we're in prayer and in meditation, when we feel the presence within, when we're living that kind of life, then we know that that calling is leading us to a larger life a grander life than anything that we have experienced before. And we also know that we can live it fearlessly. We can make those changes fearlessly. We can, we can make them knowing that absolutely everything is going to be taken care of along the way. Even though there may be rough patches along the way, and there are, and, and even though some of the changes are uncomfortable, we have that divine guidance and we make it through and we become stronger and healthier and have so many wonderful experiences as a result of it. A great gift for me was learning how to pray, how to do spiritual mind treatment. And it's something that I have always relished. I absolutely love to pray and have, have been doing a lot of praying throughout this 18 years and more when I was a practitioner. I mean, I have prayed over, you know, crying babies in restaurants. I have, have prayed over people who are out in a parking lot crying. I've prayed with homeless people. I've prayed with little children. And they're, they're the best to pray for because they believe it. And you see the most amazing results. You know, I remember one of my little granddaughters um, cutting her hand and she was crying and I went running out and she showed me her hand and, and her sister said, said to her, um, you know, get Kukum, they called me Kukum, get Kukum to pray, Jemima. That's what she does. You No, she said, get Kukum to talk to God, uh, Jemima. That's what she does, you know. And I sat with her and prayed and, and I was so surprised because with each, each uh, sentence out of my mouth, the girls both repeated each sentence 
And at the end I said, and so it is, and they shouted out, and so it is. And I bandaged Jemima's hand and they went back to their play. And later in the afternoon, um, I went out and Jemima had hurt her ankle. And, uh, and her sister said to her, how is your hand, Jemima? And Jemima pulled the bandage off and her hand was completely healed. You see, she believed so fervently in what her, her sister said to her that the universe responded. God, source, creator, whatever you want to call it, responded accordingly. And so Sadie said, okay, then let's have Kukum talk to God about your, your ankle because God did listen. It was the sweetest, most beautiful moment. How often, though, are we in prayer and we think that we don't, we don't say, oh, well, God, God is listening. God did listen. This is really done. You know, how often do we go away thinking, well, I wonder if this is ever going to work. It hasn't worked so far. I wonder what it's going to be like an hour from now or next day or next week. You know, we already have that kernel of doubt in there that, that cancels all of the good that, that we intend to have happening. In terms of being so much more of choosing a grander life, I can't help but think of, um, of um, Vladimir Zelensky, the president of the Ukraine, who was a comedian who had a television show, and in that television show he played the part of, of a president. And then he decided that he would seek the presidency and became president. And a lot of people laughed about it, thought it was a very funny thing. Well, I don't think they're laughing anymore. I, I think the entire world is completely in awe of this man at this time with the war that's going on in the beautiful Ukraine, the devastation there. And I remember the first or second day when he was offered safe passage out of the country to another, another country, to a foreign land. He said, I'm not looking for a ride. I'm looking for ammunition. And every day he's visible on television, talking to his people, sometimes out in the streets of, of Kiev. You know, right where he would be in the, in the greatest danger if there were anybody around, a sniper or anybody around who wanted to do away with him. He is fearless. He has this power within him. He's a man who was called for this time. I'm convinced of it because the Ukraine could have been taken over without a shot being fired. Well, perhaps not the Ukraine. Some countries have been taken over without, without many shots being fired. But with the, the incredible courage of the Ukrainian people and with their leader, they're putting up a, a very, very brave and courageous fight. It's sad for us to see. It's sad to know that this is happening anywhere just find myself saying every day, God, please do something. And when I do that, I'm begging. And it's not about begging. That's not the way that we pray. What we do is we see it already done. I see, you, I see peace in the Ukraine today because that is the end result. And thank you, God, for peace in the Ukraine. And thank you for loving these people. And thank you for taking care of them. And thank you for loving the Russian people who are innocent of this. Now, as I said last week, I have trouble um, loving Vladimir Putin. But what I found worked for me, because, because we are being called to love, all of us. This life here on earth is a call to love. And what I found I could do is I could see in my mind and I could say in my prayers, I see love awakening in every heart everywhere, in every country of the world. I see love fully awakened in the Ukrainian people. I see love fully awakened in the Russian people. And I see love awakened in the heart of Vladimir Putin. I can say that and I can feel love. I haven't yet got so holy <laughs> that I can say um, that I love Vladimir Putin. And I, I, you know, I'm a work in progress. <laughs> For, there's no question about that. So what we need to know is, is that this stuff really works. I remember my teacher saying to me, this stuff really, really works, Carrie. And it does. I mean, I saw that over and over again.
as a practitioner and have seen it over and over again as a minister. Someone was re referring me the other day to um, to something that Greg Braden had um, had. I guess it's a video on YouTube, and it's just it's it's in a hospital in China, where it's called called the the largest medicineless hospital in the world. And there is someone who has a, a, a kidney tumor, or is it a blood? Is it a blood? It doesn't matter which kind of tumor it is. But anyway, there's a tumor, and it is being followed by ultrasound. Sound. And as people prayed, you could see the, the tumor starting to disappear. In three minutes, it disappeared on the ultrasound as people prayed. So look it up. Look up Greg Braden and the um the un, uh, the, um, no, the the non medicalized um hospital in china and you can watch that 3 minute video for yourself and you'll see the power of prayer at work it is extraordinary i i love the story i love that there's the physical evidence of it for those who've never seen anything like this before so that they can understand I mean, there are those historically who've been able to speak their word, and it's done immediately. It's done on the spot. You know, Ernest Holmes always said it's either for him it was always done right then, or in, you could expect it to be done in the next two weeks. So, it's really important for us to use to use that prayer and to understand it. I have mentioned um, in our services the past few weeks that uh, Reverend Jennifer and I are going to start a, a practitioner class on the 20th of April. And it, it will be 10 weeks now, and then 10 weeks in the, in the fall, then another 10 weeks, and another 10 weeks after Christmas. We'll take the summer off, and we'll, take, we'll have breaks when there's special holidays. But we're do, anyway, we're doing a one-year prac course, and it's going to be very conversational between Reverend Jennifer and me, um, and there'll be lots of discussion and lots of practice um, so that everyone comes to, to know the power and to demonstrate the power and to really understand how it all works. So if that interests you, please feel free to get in touch and, and uh, we can talk about it and, and I'll, let you, I'll let you know more about it. So up until that time and from this point forward, remember... God qualifies the chosen, and everyone is chosen. Not everyone responds to the call. What is God calling you to do? What is it in your heart of hearts? Something that you might have just shoved down for a long, long time. What is it? Maybe it's time to open up again and to allow God to show you the way. You know, to depart from your country into a new land, knowing that God is showing you the way. That doesn't mean moving out of Canada, although it could, <laughs> but it means a new life, a new way of living. And this is the time. This is the time to become one of those people who is praying so powerfully that you're seeing demonstrations in your life. This is the way to a larger life a life that is filled with God. And it doesn't mean that you're going around being a holy person. I mean, you may be demonstrating holy things, but you're not going around being this holy, holy person. You're still this human being here on this planet. You're still living life as you would normally live it. But it is bumped up to a higher level because you're, you're, you're spending some time talking to God every day. And a lot of that is ingratitude. Oh. You know, thank you. You know, thank you for the fact that, you know, this traffic jam has just opened up and let me through. Oh, thank you for this short line at the checkout counter. Thank you for the beautiful flowers. Thank you for springtime. As I was driving home today, I was going down streets that were just solid pink all along with the beautiful cherry blossoms, and then the magnolia blossoms are out. And I was absolutely thrilled by all that I was seeing. And I was saying, thank you. Thank you for springtime. Thank you for this glory of spring. You know, it, it, it is a reminder that we, 
we can all wake up to a more beautiful life, to something more wonderful, more exciting. So join me in this. Join me in knowing God, in responding to whatever the calling is that is inside you, and know that, like Vladimir Zelensky, that you can go forth fearlessly in God's grace and with the help of the divine always. The journey to a larger life is God's life. There's a song that we used to sing that, that I loved, and it was, There is only one life. That life is God's life. That life is perfect. That life is my life now. That life is our lives now. Each and every one of us, God's life. Know it. Own it. Believe it. And you'll see magnificent things awakening in your own life. And so it is. Thank you for being here today. If you would care to make a donation to our center, please log on to www.cslvictoria.org and you'll see a button there that says Donate. That will take you to PayPal. And you can donate by PayPal or you can look at the fine print underneath that says or use a credit card or debit card and click on that and make a contribution to us. Or you can do an e-transfer to donate at cslvictoria.org. Everything that you give um, helps to keep our center thriving, growing, and, uh, and reaching out to more and more people everywhere. And we're so grateful for all that you do and for who you be. So I bless you on your way. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. And uh, see you soon. If you happen to drop in next week, we have a guest speaker, the absolutely wonderful Doris Lewis, who was the minister at Unity for, I think it was 13 years. She's, she's a, a fabulous person and, um, and a great, great speaker. And I know that everybody's going to really enjoy, enjoy her. So just planting that seed, if you, if you feel like coming for the first time in person, you'll get to enjoy the, the presence of, of someone that I call holy. Bless you all on your way, and I'll see you again soon. And so it is. Bye for now.